I'd like to uh, I'd like to precede this announcement. My wife and I have lived here since like 2006, and when we came down here, pastors Kevin and Susan Fletcher were pastoring this church, and a few years later, they transitioned and moved overseas, across the pond, as they call it, and uh, pastors Kevin and Susan Fletcher are Pastor Nate's in-laws, Pastor Evan's parents, and tonight, we get the honor of hearing a message from Pastor Susan. Let's honor her as she comes to minister. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you so much. Can you just stay up for just a minute? Praise God. Father, we love you tonight. Can you just lift your voices to him? Lift your hands to him. Father, we're honored to come together in this house. We're so blessed to know you. We're so blessed to be called by your name. We thank you for Beyond Church. We thank you for a place where we can come and hear your word, where we can be, um, we, can, we can grow up in Christ. We can hear your word. We can learn what we need to learn. We can be discipled. And we can together corporately reach and pray and be your hands and be your feet and be your mouth and be your voice, be healing, bring healing to people and salvation. We thank you for this house and what it means to this area. But even as the name would say, not just here, but even beyond, beyond this community, to places yet untouched, but they will be touched. And we're grateful and we're honored. And so, Holy Spirit, I know that you've put things in my heart and I'm asking you to just bring it out the way you want. The words, the examples, just everything. And then between the lines, I'm asking you to do what you do so amazing and that is to tailor make it and to speak to every heart. Jesus said to him that hath ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. So as I'm teaching, there's what I'm saying. But what is most important is what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. So we open up our ears to hear what it is that you want to say. And we're asking you to do what you want to do. We're asking just for fire in every heart renewed passion, renewed vision, maybe where things have been laid down, just picked back up again. For some that don't know and, and haven't known to pick up some things, may this be just a fire that is caught for them to pick up and to walk in things that you would have them walk in. And we thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You can be seated. All right, let me get my little notes here. It's freezing. I just want to say, is this Arkansas? What is even happening here? Do you guys think it's, you know, cold? Anybody? Okay, it's not just me. Um, so the Lord has put something in my heart, and um, one of the things and one of the ways that the Lord uses me and actually positioned us as... Um, we came out of Bible college and went to work with the ministry. We became a part of a ministry and we're really, we, we had the privilege of just learning so much in the 22 years that um, we were with Pastor Mac and Lynn. But one of the things that forever changed me was um, this impartation of prayer um, that happened in my life being schooled in prayer and being taught in prayer, but it was it was more than the mechanics of it. You know how you can learn mechanics of things? It was the heart and the fire of it that came into me that's that's forever changed me. And um and that fire actually has forever changed some of you because I know um some of you have been privileged to receive that same type of thing. So tonight, um, 
we're going to talk a little bit about prayer, but it's in the context of this. If you could write, maybe write down a title, it would be this. But why, why we pray for leaders? Why we pray, and I want to emphasize for leaders. So oftentimes within Christian circles, we hear terminology like this, praying against. Have you heard that before? Maybe somebody in leadership, maybe you didn't vote for or like, or maybe you don't care for very much. You know what I mean? Rub you the wrong way. Anybody, anybody ever had that? Don't raise your hand. You, just, you, don't, you don't even want. But our challenge as a Christian is to do what the Bible says and to pray for. So we're going to talk about that tonight. But before we get too far into this, I want to lay a little bit of a foundation because I, I think it's going to help you to understand why this is important. And if maybe prayer is one of those things, it's like seriously, like a whole message tonight on something that I have to do. Um, I want you just to back up your train and I want you to throw that out and I want you as best you can to have a clean slate and to let the Holy Spirit talk to you about the significant adventure and partnership with God that prayer actually is. Prayer becomes super like check in a box and really boring and void of any power or impact or anything like that when it becomes something that we do. But when we understand that prayer is something we come into partnership with God to do, it changes everything. And it changes even how we approach it. So please bear with me tonight. But I do need to lay a foundation. So you know that uh, the, the quality of any foundation um, will greatly impact the integrity of the structure that's built on it, right? So if you have a weak foundation or no foundation or a damaged foundation and you just try and go ahead and build on that, eventually the integrity of whatever you're building is going to feel that and it's going to be weak and it's going to crumble and it's going to fail, okay? So foundations are really important. So as I'm teaching tonight, I want us to go back in history just a little bit, again, so that you have a better understanding and the significance of this nation and your place as a Christian when it comes to praying for leaders. And um, I want to say leaders that are in government, but all kinds of leaders, Leaders that are Christian leaders. And as we're talking about leaders, your pastors are leaders. You have leaders in your church. What about husbands and wives that are leading families? So leaders play significant roles and have a sphere of influence that God wants to work through. He wants to bring his will to pass through leaders. But in order for that to happen, we're going to have to partner with God and let him pray some things that need to be prayed in order to write foundations. So the United States of America, if you didn't know this or realize the significance of it, this is why we're going to go back and do a little bit of history. But America was birthed at a definite time for a definite purpose. Okay? A definite time for a definite purpose. And the Bible tells us that there is a time for every purpose under heaven. So first of all, we have to know that the United States has a divine destiny. A divine destiny. And um, it's got a divine purpose. And it's more than just freedom um, as maybe freedom is defined today, which is kind of getting to do what we want to do, when we want to do it, however we want to do it. That's the definition that, that freedom probably is taken on. Um, but anyway, um, the significance of this United States, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because it's affected our whole culture and how we've been built. Okay, that's why 
I'm doing this. Um, so in Europe, because Europeans, primarily Europeans, came here to establish America. And what you saw in um, Europe at the time is that in Europe, um, the nations in Europe and all the land was owned by, I guess we would say, royalty. So there was definitely a class system. The upper class, that upper tier, those who were kings and queens and princes and all that kind of stuff, they owned everything. And if you weren't in that class, your destiny was to always be without and be subservient to. Okay? But then there was something that came along called the new world. And the lure and the attraction of the new world is that the common man could actually go somewhere where they could acquire. They could dream the dream and become whatever they wanted to be. They could get houses, lands. They could get an education. They could acquire wealth, something that would never be open to them if they stayed where they were. And this was the lure of the new world. Now, for some, it was they wanted religious freedom. But for a lot who came, it was about increase. It was about acquiring more. And that has influenced our American culture ever since. Where the American dream and the purpose for which I think a lot of us maybe have thought we were here is to be able to be whatever it is we want to be. Maybe we even have said that to our kids. Hey, you can be whatever you want to be. But actually, we're going to look and read a few scriptures here, and I think I gave them to you guys. Maybe we can pop them up on the screens. But Galatians 5.1 says this. This is why foundation is important. It says, it was for this freedom that Christ set us free, completely liberating us. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery which you once removed. It's for freedom that we were set free in Christ, but it's for freedom that God planted you and I here. It's for freedom. Not freedom that is just invested or spent on ourselves, but it's for the freedom of those who don't know Christ. That they would come out from under the freedom or, or the slavery of sin and, and Satan. 1 Corinthians 9.19 says, For although I am free in every way from anyone's control, I have made myself a bondservant to everyone so that I might gain the more for Christ. So the American dream has influenced culture. In, um, in that there has been a mentality, even maybe a driving force of acquiring, acquiring, acquiring. And it can be at the expense of other things that are more important and more vital. God's not against us having stuff, but he does not want stuff to have us. All right? And this can influence a lot of things. Last scripture here in this little section, Galatians 5.13 says, For you, brethren, were indeed called to freedom, only do not let your freedom be an incentive to your flesh and an opportunity or excuse for selfishness, but through love you should serve one another. So it's for freedom that we've been set free. And God birthed this nation and at a time, um, a significant time, with this purpose that we were to use freedom to fuel a gospel move around the world. We were to use freedom for that. Um, and everything that would come out of freedom, the ability to achieve, the ability to be educated, the ability to, and the freedom to know God, to worship God, but then to take the word of God and use it, use it to empower and fuel what it is that God is doing. So 
So this is a good foundation for what we're going to talk about tonight. So you have to know and understand that the enemy is going to want to work against that purpose. And one of the ways he's going to do is he wants to distract us. He wants us to be a bit confused in what our purpose and, and what we're here to do. Um, he wants to run interference. There are a lot of things that he wants us to do to pull us off the mission that God would have for us. But God is interested for harvest. He's interested in harvest. And I know um, in your church, I love the hearts of your pastor and actually your leadership team and actually all of you because you guys have a heart to reach. You have a heart to know God and you have a heart to reach out. And, um, and I want to commend you on that, man. It's awesome and it's inspiring. But in order for harvest time to be everything that God wants harvest time to be, for us to be able to reach, it's going to take us going and praying for our leaders. Leaders are people that the enemy has his eye on um, because if he can manipulate them like puppets, then he will also be able to influence masses that they're leading. And we've already talked a little bit about, you know, um, about how the enemy really tried to take a God-given purpose for America, which is to take the gospel around the world and turn it to be about self-indulgence. And that wasn't God's plan nor his attention. And I'll just say, we, we get the privilege of going lots of different places in the world. And I will tell you, I have never seen the blessing in a nation like I have this nation. But to whom much is given, much is required. And so... Um, when, it, when we talk about our leaders and um, when we talk about harvest time, God's will is that men, all men would be saved, all people, men, women, children, young people would be saved and come to the knowledge of him. But it isn't up to God alone. He on purpose created the body of Christ to be in partnership with. That's you and me. And so there's a part we, we play. So we know that in our nation, and in fact, in nations around the world, there are a lot of issues. There are a lot of things that are going on. Have you noticed that? Wow. Like, we come back here, and um, we were, um, oh, we were picking up our rental car when we flew into California. We came, we were in California before here. And they had, like, a late night talk show thing on and I don't even know who the guy is because we don't ever watch it I, I'm so out of touch I, I don't even know y'all might know but his monologue wow was on like you couldn't make it quit I wanted to make it quit but there was so much seed being sown um, to fuel division and hatred and um, I love that God called this nation the United States of America because there's so much that can be accomplished when we're united. And ever since then, the enemy's been working to divide what God has united. All right? So let's look here at a little bit because I want to speak to you tonight about your authority when it comes to prayer. And how God wants to use you. Ephesians 1, we're going to read a long passage here, but I want you to stay with me if you can. Ephesians 1, and then beginning with verse 17. And many of you may be familiar with this. It may be something that you're praying over your um, family or your pastors or, you know, different people that you know. But it says this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, 
the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glorious, the glory of his inheritance in the saints. This is what God wants for you. He wants you to know his will. He wants you to be full of knowledge and experience with him. That's what he wants for you, okay? That you would know um, what is the exceeding greatness of his power, and when we talk about harvest, God's power is involved in harvest. All right? Powerful demonstrations, his word in power and in demonstration. What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us believe, who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand? Look, he's, he's far above. And the Bible says he was given this place far above all principality, power, might, dominion, every name that, that is named, not only in this age, but also in the ages which are to come, and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And that's so awesome. We know that Jesus was raised from the dead victorious, but you need to keep reading. He's up here, and his enemies are down here. He's up here, enemies down here. But that's not the end of the story. All right. Go on into chapter 2. And you, everybody say me. You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin in which you once walked According to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, you were down here. This is where you and I were. We were down here, functioning from down here. Ever feel like life is stomping on you? This is where we feel we are sometimes. And it says, um, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also... We all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just like the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, wherewith he loved us, and I'll add on, and he loves all people everywhere, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, way under has made us alive together with Christ, and by grace you are saved. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. So for you and I, the position that we've been given is a victorious, not a victim place. It's a victorious place. And this is the place we're to be functioning from. This is the place we're to be praying from. Not under things, not even eye level with the things that are going on. But up above, praying. Okay? Enforcing the enemy's defeat. And so we've been given authority. We've been given dominion. But honestly, we ha haven't always exercised this the way we should. And if we, it, it can be several reasons if we haven't known about it. Or maybe we found out about it, but it's just been hard for us to believe. Really? That I could have authority and dominion. I could actually expect that my prayers would be answered. That prayer, my prayers could, could move heaven and earth. My prayers could make the difference in someone coming to Christ or someone not coming to Christ. My prayers could make a difference in the success of this ministry and the impact of this ministry. Yeah, absolutely it could. But we have a real enemy, and he's always working to try and stop forward motion. And above all, he doesn't want to see the law saved. He doesn't want to see those. He doesn't want to see believers come to this kind of knowledge. 
Because this is when we really get dangerous. When we know who we are in Christ and we know what we've been called to do and we start operating in it. And so um, if I was a policewoman, which I'm not, but if I was, and maybe I just decided, you know, even though I've been authorized, I've been trained, I've been empowered, but when I go out, when I'm slotted in to, um, you know, uh, to do my job, and I go out and I um, am distracted, maybe instead of watching like I'm supposed to be watching or being on, I don't even know if this is the right terminology, but maybe I'm supposed to be on a beat. Is that right? Okay, just walking where I'm supposed to be walking. I don't know what I'm talking about there. But, you know, but if I don't go where I've been assigned to go, and if I'm not vigilant and watching, and here's something else, even if I'm present and I'm there, if I see things happening, but I'm passive and don't do anything about it, how many of you know words like that, that kind of word is going to travel around those that would be criminally minded. And they're going to go, you know what, if we want to rob the bank in Alma, or if we want to break into someone's home, we need to be sure and do it when she's on duty because she's, she's, she won't do anything about it. We don't want to be those people. <laughs> when it comes to praying for our leaders and praying for the plans and purposes of God. And so we've got to know that our prayers make a difference. Second Chronicles 7.14 says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Very often we look at the state um, of the church or we look at the state of America or whatever nation you might be from and we want to blame it on politicians. We want to blame it on um, uh, uh, government officials. We want to blame it on the leaders on the church. But God said this, that if we as his people will do some things that are here, if we'll humble ourselves, if we'll pray, if we'll work with him in prayer, um, if we'll um, ask for forgiveness, if we keep our hearts tender and we're listening and we're, you know, um, we're responding to the Lord, it's amazing what he said he would do. But there is something we need to do. And that is um, we need to pray. So a definition of being passive, I wrote down. It's not like a dictionary one. It's just what came to me when I think of being passive. Not taking action when we are authorized to take it. That's kind of being passive. Not taking action when we're actually authorized to take it or when we should take it enabling the enemy to be victorious. We could say it this way, doing nothing when we have the power to do something. Right? And, um, and prayer is huge where that is, is concerned. So I want you to know today that your prayers, maybe some of you have, you know, um, questioned the value of your prayers, the effectiveness of your prayers. Maybe you've struggled with even knowing um, how to pray. And because of that, you've backed away. I pray tonight that you'll be fueled. And I know there are prayer groups that are meeting in this church. And I encourage if you're not in one, get in one. Because it can help you be equipped. And it can help you gain confidence to take your place in prayer instead of backing away from it. Um, all right, praise the Lord. So let's kind of get to where we need to go. First Timothy chapter 2 and verses 1 through 4. 
1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. It says this, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so um, we all have loads of stuff going on in our lives. You know, we'll just call it stuff. You know what I'm talking about. We all have loads of stuff. But this scripture actually gives us some important prioritizing. You know, when you look at time management, one of the first things that um, you will be, you will learn about or you'll be spoken to about is identifying your tasks and then deciding if, um, if they are important, if they are urgent, if, so there's, you know, different things that you do in um, order to help you prioritize your time and invest your time in the most important activities. God has kind of done this for us when it comes to our Christian life. And he said, first of all, I want you to pray for. I want you to pray for all men, and here's kind of the breakdown. When we pray for leaders... The Bible lets us see in this scripture that it is so we can lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, and it contributes to that. But it's also so that all men can be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So listen, praying for our leaders isn't the same as talking about them. I'm going to say that one more time. Praying for our leaders isn't the same as talking about them. And um, what I've noticed in the world in general is that when it comes to leadership offices, there has been a steady attack from the devil to I don't even know if this is the right word, dishonor. I want to say devalue those offices of leadership and fueled, um, almost fueled people just saying whatever they want to say whenever they want to say it. But the Bible tells us that if we want to see harvest, and don't you want to? Oh, there's so many people that need Jesus. More people on the planet than ever before. And a real key to us seeing the harvest brought in is for us to pray. And specifically to pray for leaders, for all men, but to pray for leaders. Um, that all men would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So let's look at a couple other scriptures in line with this. I want you to understand why praying for them is, por is so important and why talking about them is so detrimental. Our words are actually so powerful and they carry the ability to bring life or to bring death. Our words are really important. And, um, and I know we don't always love, you know, every leader or maybe we question whether or not they ought to be leading something, whatever it might be, at many different levels of leadership. But at the, at the forefront of all of this, the Lord says to pray for them. And here's the deal. Leaders need the wisdom of God to lead in a way that will cause us to, um, to be at peace and lead in a way where actually there, um, uh, there is justice that is extended. Where truth and where light and where, ju where justice can prevail. Let me say it to you this way. Leaders, I don't care who they are. 
will never come up with the solutions or answers that are needed for the problems we're facing. They can't do it themselves. They need a wisdom far greater than human wisdom. Husbands and wives, you need a wisdom greater than your experience or what you think you know or what I think I know to lead my family well. If you're leading a business, you need the wisdom of God to lead it well. Leaders need wisdom. And the Bible tells us in Ephesians 3.10 um, that the manifold wisdom of God um, might be made known by the church to principalities and powers. This is God's plan, that his wisdom that light would be manifested through the church, that's you. And that's done through um, teaching and preaching when you share your testimonies, but it's also done when we pray. Wisdom from God can be dispensed to those that are leading to help them lead well. Okay? Not everyone is open to receive all of that, but bless the Lord, it's our job to make it available. All right? It's our job to make it available. So when we look at the conditions and the things that are going on, it can be really easy to point. But I want to encourage you, don't point. Stop and remember that you've been given authority. And that your praying for people can make all the difference. Proverbs 8, verses 14 through 16. Proverbs 8, 14 through 16 says, I have counsel and sound knowledge. I have understanding. I have might and power. This is wisdom talking. This is God, godly wisdom. I have might and power. Listen to this. By me, kings reign and rulers decree justice. If we want justice decrees, then we're going to have to pray for leaders so that God's wisdom can be dispensed to them. Because that's the only way they're going to be able to draw from that wisdom. All right? By me, princes rule, nobles, even all the judges and the governors of the earth. Without the wisdom of God, we won't see justice. It takes the wisdom of God for leaders to rule in justice and in truth. So it's been established that in leadership offices, um, it's required that people operate in God's wisdom. We need God's wisdom. Praise God, individually as Christians, we can go to the word, the wisdom of God, and we can feed on that every day. But we have a lot of leaders that are in positions, and there is so much opposition, and there is so much warfare, and there is so much resistance to them doing the right thing and making the right decisions. And what we don't want to do as God's people is leave them out to dry. Well, I don't really like them. And I've struggled with this in times in my life. I don't, I don't really like them so much. And it's hard for me to pray for them. But that's all the more reason why I should. All the more reason why I should. So tonight, this isn't about politics. It's, it's not about any of that. It is about um, harvest, souls, lives that God wants to touch. And it is about what's going on in the spiritual realm where Satan is working to try and keep the light. Um, listen, when you start to see... Um, Christians and the freedoms that we have as Christians being taken away, like 
um, in our country, prayer out of schools. They're removing, um, have been. Now, I know there's been some changes recently, but I'm just saying you look for certain things and go, when these things are happening, we don't want to take a passive stance. Oh, well, you know, it's just the world. It's just how it is. Oh, well. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. I can still pray at home. And, you know, we'll work around it. It's no. We don't want to be down here. We want to remember as the church we're up here. And because we've been given a place of authority and dominion, the Lord wants us to exercise that. And we don't do it through hate. We don't do it by going on the attack. We do it by getting on our knees. Now, you can also be involved, you know, when it comes to, you know, our country and, and voting. You should be involved in that. But you can't rely only on that. Here's another thing that we've seen sometimes is that when a Christian is in an area of leadership, sometimes in the body we're like, oh, good. We got a Christian now. That's great. And you know what we do? We hang them out to dry. We don't undergird them. We don't pray for them anymore. We used to go to Washington, D.C. like every summer for several years we did to meet with our representatives there. And there was one man that we talked to at the time. I'm not so aware of American politics right now because we're in England. So I'm probably actually a little more aware of them. But um, I don't know if this man is even in office or not anymore. But um, at the time, we remember sitting and talking with him, and his wife was there. And they, um, they were Christians. And his wife was there working in the office. And she was like, oh, yeah, we made the decision that I was going to be here and I was going to work with them. You know, there's so much pressure in Washington, D.C. put on marriages. There's such a strain because sometimes the wives and the families are in one place and the husbands are serving in another. And we decided we weren't going to be one of those casualties. I thought that was so great. But you can even look at that and go, oh, well, maybe we don't need, they've got a good brain, good head on their shoulder, soldiers, uh, shoulders, maybe we don't need to um, pray for them. But there, when people are elevated into positions of authority, you know, they kind of gain the enemy's attention. And there's a lot of people that can be impacted through leaders. Leaders in the church, your pastors, um, more prominent leaders in the body of, the, of Christ. They, I'm going to say this because I want it to come across this way. They need your prayers. And I'll go a step further. They have to have your prayers. So praise God. For those that are in the word themselves and they're um, having their time with God themselves. But there is a corporate supply that our leaders need from the body of Christ. And it comes as we unite and as we begin to pray. And so um, let me see if there's any other scriptures. James 3.15. So it takes wisdom to rule and to lead. And if we as the church aren't doing um, what it is that we've been assigned to do, which is first of all pray for kings, for all men who are in authority, and for kings, for leaders, if we're not doing that, they may not receive the wisdom from God that they need, and by default, they will pull wisdom from a lower level. By default, they'll pull wisdom from another level. And you know what that is? Reasoning, fear of man, what's going to please, what seems right. Have you ever, um, you know, and maybe if some of you are newer Christians, um, you've noticed this some. Some of you have been Christians a little longer, may have noticed it a little bit more. But when you were in the world, things that seemed so fun and great to do, when you came to Christ a little bit later, you were just like, what was I thinking? 
Have you ever had that little epiphany? Like, what, what in the world was I thinking? That was just like, wow, that was not a good way to be living. You know, or whatever. Well, that's because, you know what? When you pull from the wisdom of the world, things can seem really good and right and fun, and you're not seeing them for what they really are. But when the wisdom of God comes, there's so much light with it. And it's such a help. It's the very thing that can wake somebody up to go, what was I thinking? Our leaders need help. Husbands and wives need help. If there's any children in here praying for your parents, they need help in parenting. Some of you who are kids might go, yeah, I know. <laughs> but we need help. I want to be a godly leader. We've seen people who have stepped into leadership roles who had the best intentions and heart and loved God. People that wanted to serve our nation well. And maybe four years down the road, everything changed for them. What made the difference? They're in that place of authority. And darkness is working to try and destroy and to influence. And it's very real. It's very real. Jesus said to his disciples, remember he said, pray that you enter not into temptation. And I think very often when we've read that, we looked at it like Jesus was saying, pray that. Oh, I pray that I won't enter into temptation. But I think he was saying, pray. Pray. There's something about prayer that's strengthening. There's a supply. Paul said, by your prayers and through your prayers and the bountiful supply of the Spirit, this is working to my preservation. When we pray, if you could see life and power are coming out of you. And that life and power is flowing to the people and the situations and things that we're praying about to bring help, to bring strength, to bring deliverance, to bring the wisdom of God. And if we're not praying, where's that going to come from? If we're not praying for the harvest, who's going to pray for the harvest? If we're not going to share our faith with those who don't know Jesus, who's going to do it? If we're not going to pray for the lost, who's going to do it? If not us, who? If not now, when? If not here, where? So praise God for this wonderful partnership we have with God. And being able to be used by him to pray. And, you know, if you don't know how to pray, man, one of the best ways you can pray is find scripture and pray it. Find scripture and pray it. Find scripture and pray it. What you don't want to do is pray your opinions. Don't do that. Because we might have it wrong. We want to take God's word, which is truth, and we want to pray it. And if you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you're able to pray in other tongues, that's another great way. The Bible tells us that through praying that way, we kind of like bypass our mind and we can pray out the perfect will of God for the saints, the Bible says. It's not even tainted by what we would want or wouldn't want. And I love that. It's another way to pray effective prayers. And so um, don't get, don't allow the enemy to discourage you when it comes to prayer. And to um, tell you, you know, you don't know what you're doing. Your prayers aren't valuable. Your prayers are powerful. And the reason that those lies are coming to you 
is because the one thing the devil is afraid of is that you will come to the realization your prayers make a difference. And, um, and when God's people pray, oh, you know, there has always been a um, growing movement of prayer before we saw great outpourings. That's what we see in history. And we know that this harvest is imminent. We're already seeing it. But there are so many that are going to come in, and I believe they're actually going to come in pretty quickly. But there are going to be powerful demonstrations, I believe that, of the Holy Spirit because it's needed. And prayer pave, paves the way. Prayer fuels what God is doing. So I want to encourage you. Make prayer a priority. When you sow your time to do the things of the kingdom, God will cause your time to be multiplied back to you. He does that. Have you seen that in finances when you started tithing or giving, how God multiplied and increased you? Well, he'll do the same with your time. He will. He's so good like that. Can we stand together? Father, um, as we're getting ready to close, and I'll turn this over. Who do I turn this over to when I'm done? Is it you, Jake, or Pastor, or you? Okay. So, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to hear your word tonight. And, Lord, first of all, we just want to say thank you for calling us partners. Thank you for choosing us. Aren't you glad that he's chosen us tonight? Father, you honor me I feel so honored by that, that you created me on purpose, for a purpose, and that you chose me. I thank you, Lord, that as I look over this group of people, these are chosen ones. They are chosen by you to be here right now in this place at this time partnered with you to do your work, to work with you to bring in the harvest, the harvest of little boys and little girls, of teenagers, of adults, of every age, partnered with you to see them come to Christ because you love them so much. We get to do this with you. And it's so supernatural, and it's so amazing. And we're so honored that you would choose us. And so, Lord, we just want to honor you. We want to honor you by saying yes. We just want to honor you by saying, you know what? If you said that we're chosen, we believe we're chosen. If we're called, we believe we're called. If you said that our prayers would be effective this way by partnering with you, then we're just going to believe that the prayers you lead us to pray, you're going to work through them to get the job done. You're going to touch leaders. You're going to touch people. You're going to move in situations. You're going to right things that have been wronged. You're going to make crooked paths straight. You're going to cause rough things to be made smooth. You're going to cause obstacles and hindrances to be removed. You're going to cause valleys to be filled in so that there is a straight highway for the glory of the Lord, for the word of God to speed on and to spread rapidly. Father, we're joining together and we're asking you, for Alma. We're asking you for Van Buren. We're asking you for Fort Smith. We're asking you for Mulberry. We're asking you, I don't even know the names of the cities anymore, but wherever you're from, just begin to ask. We're asking you for this state. We're asking you for the people in the state of Arkansas to be born again, 
filled with the Spirit, walking in the fullness of your plan. We're asking you to pour out your Spirit. Pour out your Spirit in our schools. Pour out your Spirit on the college campus in Fort Smith. Pour out your Spirit in every business that is represented here. Pour out your spirit and do what only you can do. You said in the time of the latter rain to ask. And so that's what we're doing. But I don't ask with wondering. I ask with faith and confidence because when you say ask, it's because you're poised and ready to answer. You want to answer that prayer. So we thank you for outpouring. We thank you for harvest coming in. We thank you for manifestations of your healing power, for um, your spirit, your word in spirit and in demonstration. And Father, I lift up this couple, Pastor Nate and Pastor Evan. I lift up all the leaders in this church and everyone that calls this church their home church. And I thank you, Lord, for clarity of vision. They see what you want them to see. They know on the inside the way you're leading and the way that they're to go. They hear your voice. They accurately discern. And they know. They know. They know where to drop the nets. They know when to go. They have the right words at the right time. You position them with the right people at the right time. Oh, they make the right decisions. We thank you for that. We lift up those working with the youth and the children. And I thank you, Father. I'm asking you, fill them with your wisdom and your heart to teach our, um, our children well. To teach them what it is to follow you. To teach them truths that will impact their lives forever. Oh, Father, words that are alive in them that will come out alive, not a form, not a frame, but full of your power and life. Bring them in to God encounters. I ask for 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 dreams. Those that don't know you, dreams of Jesus and his truth. Lord, only you are the way. You're the only one that can make a difference. And we're partnered with you to help you build your church and to do what you want to do in the earth. We are those people that we keep saying yes to you. We keep saying yes. Let's say that to him tonight. We say yes. We say yes. We say yes. Before you even ask, we have an answer, and it's always yes. It's always yes. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you will do. And get all the glory in Jesus' name. Why don't you guys grab a seat? I, I want to finish with just a comment here, a couple of comments, actually. Thank you so much, Pastor Susan. Can we honor her for the, bringing that word? So good. You know, it's okay to clap and demonstrate honor to someone for bringing a message, for preparing and praying into what she brought tonight. Man, thank you, Pastor Susan. You know, I want to just extend a little more honor on to Pastor Kevin and Susan here just for a quick moment. We, I grew up in Minnesota. She grew up in, or I, th I think y'all grew up in Minnesota. I don't know. No, you didn't. Florida. Whatever. When I grew up, you guys were there. I was in junior high, and she recruited some junior hires to join a prayer group that she just wanted to lead. She wanted to teach prayer. And, and I have memories of eating carpet while spirit, doing spirit-led prayer under her leadership with Pastor Nate and Pastor Evan. At the time, you know, they just liked each other. Myself, 
and a few other people of our age. I don't know how old we were, maybe around 13, 14, 15 years old. Sheena, too, she was recruited in. And, and we had some amazing, like, just learning prayer. And, and sometimes Pastor Susan would show up with, like, a, a McDonald's bag full of, like, cheeseburgers. And, you know, here, here's a whole bunch of cheeseburgers just fed us and then literally just prayed. And, you know, sometimes I fell asleep, like a lot of us probably do. And that's okay. But you know what? That, but I remember more the impartation, the learning. And I believe tonight a, a fire was lit to, to pray more. And here's what we can do with that. On the ride home tonight, when we're going to bed tonight, just that commitment back to God. God, I commit to pray more. And there's opportunities to pray here, guys. <clears throat> men's, there's a men's group. It's, it's twice a month for 45 minutes it's at, during like 9.15 to 10 p.m., which is the time that every man is usually just, you know, just doing this, right? Or Netflix, whatever. Come on. Or women's, no pressure. I'm just saying there's opportunities. First Tuesday of the month, night of prayer. First Tuesday from 7 to 8, 8.15 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. Let's do this. Prayer changes things. Anyway, sorry, that was three minutes, but let's, let's not just let this out, all right? You guys are dismissed. See you.